So they came in my office and they would say, let me tell you what's really going on. And it was all about the stuff that you had alluded to, you know, it's all about, you know, sex drive and mood and body composition and motivation and, you know, a, you know, appetite regulation, concentration, mental focus, uh, memory, you know, they're just be like, I don't feel like myself. I feel like there's something wrong or something missing here. And they don't know exactly what's going on because they don't talk to each other about this either, <laughs> but they just feel like there's something a little off, right? And again, like I had this great sports medicine background and I was planning to go back into orthopedic surgery as my residency. And I'm just kind of befuddled and I'm like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> like I, I don't know why you're having all these problems. This doesn't make any sense to me. And one thing that was mentioned almost as an aside was that they didn't sleep very well. What is up, my friend, and welcome to the Legendary Life Podcast. I'm health expert Ted Rice, coach to entrepreneurs, executives, and other high-performing professionals. And what we do here at Legendary Life is break down science-based information on how to lose fat, prevent disease, and live a long, healthy, legendary life. So if that's what you're into, you are in the right place. Click that subscribe button wherever you listen to podcasts so that every time one of my episodes goes live, you'll be the first to know. According to the CDC, more than one quarter of the U.S. population report occasionally not getting enough sleep, while nearly 10% experience chronic insomnia. And we know that insufficient sleep is associated with a number of chronic diseases and conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, depression, dementia, Alzheimer's, low testosterone, the list goes on. And that's why I'm very excited to introduce you to today's guest. His name is Dr. Kirk Parsley, and he is a big advocate of sleep and the power of high quality sleep to optimize our health and performance. Another thing that's fascinating about Dr. Kirk Parsley's background is that he was a Navy SEAL and ended up working with the SEALs as a doctor specializing in how to optimize their health. And he's going to share with you what he found wrong with some of the SEALs. And as you probably know, the Navy SEALs are one of the most elite, if not the most elite force on the planet. And he's going to share with you how working with the SEALs and some of the problems they experience because of their high stress jobs and missions that they go on led him to learning about hormones, learning about how sleep affects hormones, and learning about how to optimize health because sleep forms one of the four pillars of health in Dr. Kirk Parsley's evolutionary medicine approach. And he's going to explain to you what evolutionary medicine is, how he got into this whole idea of merging ancient wisdom with cutting edge technology to help people feel, perform, and look their best. So enjoy this interview with Dr. Kirk Parsley. Welcome to the Legendary Life Podcast. Thank you. My pleasure to be on the Legendary Life Podcast. How you doing? Good, man. And I was about to, I kind of stumbled there. I was about to say welcome back because we had a few tech issues the first time this went down. So thanks so much for coming back on and, and uh, helping everyone get their sleep and hormones in order. Maybe the tech issues you know, saved some of your listeners from a long, long, long podcast or you know, perhaps saved us from uh, you know, boring everyone to death and decreasing our market value. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. And so if you don't know Dr. Kirk Parsley, he's a former Navy SEAL turned medical doctor, and he has this amazing practice right now where he's going around helping people with their hormones. He's big into sleep. And Kirk, I'd like to start off like this because you talk a lot about hormones there's yep. endocrinologists for that. You talk a lot about sleep. There's sleep medicine experts for that. And I think 
if I didn't know as much as I do, I might be the guy who's asking, okay, Kirk, you're a medical doctor and you're specializing this in this stuff, but why would I want to listen to you about endocrinology or about sleep medicine versus these other guys who actually specialized in it. Can you break down? I know what I think and I know my answer, but I'd love to hear you break it down for someone who maybe doesn't understand the way medicine works right now. Yeah, that's a uh, very poignant, but, but good question. I hadn't thought of it in that terms, but I like the way you phrase that. So basically, I, I think the best way to, to think about medicine in general, and this is a conversation that I usually have with just about everybody, you know, from cocktail parties to clients. But I think that there's a misnomer out there. And I think that the misnomer is that doctors and nurses and physicians assistants and all those people do health care. They don't. They do disease care. That's kind of where they're, I separate away from the pack, if you will. So, you know, in your example of an endocrinologist, you know, if you had, say, thyroid cancer and you had to have your thyroid ablated, an endocrinologist would be a great person to help you manage your thyroid. You know, if you have one of these super rare kind of diseases, endocrine diseases that need to be managed with multiple hormones just to kind of keep you alive, that's what an endocrinologist is for. They are there to treat you once you have a disease. If you're a type 1 diabetic or uh, even a type 2 diabetic, oftentimes they're managed by endocrinologists if their general practitioner can't manage their, their disease well sleep specialists, a sleep medicine specialist, they specialize in diagnosing and treating sleep disease. So like obstructive sleep apnea or central sleep apnea or restless leg syndrome or any one of 85 or so different sleep disorders. So again, these guys are doing disease care. So if you think of, I always tell people to think of your health care insurance, just like you think of your auto insurance. If you have, you know, if you have a car and you have it insured, and you crash your car, you know, that's like the equivalent of disease. And then your insurance steps in and helps you manage that disease, repair that car or total that car or whatever that is. I've recently been reminded of that as my 17-year-old son crashed the car that I gave him for his <laughs> oh, birthday, no. which, which I knew would happen. But, you know, whatever. That's part of the learning curve of life. But your insurance company doesn't pay for you to rotate your tires or put new tires on your car when they need them or change your oil or clean your car or replace broken lights or, you know, little niggle things, you know, electronics and whatever. Your insurance company doesn't do anything for that. That's healthcare, right? Like, you know, that should be what we call healthcare. We're talking about performance there. And what I do with my clients and with you know, whether I'm, I'm say, keeping somebody as it for a year long program, or if I'm just going into, say, lecture a, an organization, you know, a corporation or a sports team, or if I'm working with, you know, one individual, a professional athlete, or, one, you know, the CEO of the corporation or whatever, or I'm doing DOD or DOJ or, you know, any of these types of people, what I'm talking to them about is health, right? And I'm talking about optimizing performance. So, to give the example of an endocrinologist, one of the big problems that I ran into with the SEALs, but I run into it with everybody now in the private sector, professional athletes, you name it, everybody, and I see this over and over again. We have all these, say, you know, let's call it 35 year old guys who have a testosterone level of, you know, like your total testosterone level of about 300 out of a bell curve that goes from 250 to 1100. An endocrinologist would say, you're normal. Yeah. You're within the bell curve, good to go, quit whining, here's your bill, see you later. Whereas somebody who practices medicine like I do would say, okay, you're 35 years old, you know, you're six foot one, you're 240 pounds, you're jacked, you, you know, you have to, you're a Navy SEAL, you have to carry all this equipment and be able to throw your buddy with all of his equipment over your shoulders and run up over hills and climb walls and kick in doors and you aren't going to do that with a total testosterone of 300. I mean, you, you are, and they do, <laughs> but you're going to suffer a lot more than you should. So let's figure out why your testosterone is only 300. And keep in mind, the last thing that I do is actually give guys testosterone. That's, the, like, that's, that's when everything else has failed, then I give people testosterone. But there's lots of ways to improve testosterone, you know, as one example. But we could talk about any hormone in the same format. 
And it all comes down to the, you know, the four pillars of health. There's sleep, nutrition, exercise, and stress mitigation. And until you've idealized or optimized those four things, you shouldn't even be thinking about drugs. So that's a really long answer of, uh, of how I separate myself out from disease care specialist. Absolutely, man. No, it's more more important that you do the talking than I do, <laughs> or else uh, I should be on your show, right? You have right. a podcast coming out soon. I saw on your website. Yeah, we've been going back and forth of whether or not we're going to make that an audio or a video, and now there's an opportunity to make it into like a, a multi-channel, uh, multiple digital channels, multiple radio stations, and so forth. And I just, I just don't know yet. I just something I just haven't had time to develop, but something I definitely want to do. Awesome. Um, so if you're yeah. listening to this right now, Doctor Kirk Parsley is like blowing up all over the place, and he's going to be someone who's. Is someone you need to pay attention to if optimal health, if feeling and performing your best is something that's important to you. And of course, if you're listening to this show, then obviously it is, right? Because, you know, having low sex drive, being overweight and tired all the time is there's nothing legendary about that. <laughs> so, so Kirk, for those people who haven't heard your story before, can you talk a little bit how you even got into this? Because as I mentioned before, you're a former Navy SEAL and you turned into a medical doctor. And instead of just becoming part of the system, you've gone off and you've gone rogue and like yeah, yeah. done your own thing, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. It was actually when you talk about the military, and it's true of lots of organizations, but when you talk about the military, you're talking about layers of bureaucracy on top of layers of bureaucracy. And so that's where I found myself as a medical doctor. So, you know, just sort of give the reader's digest version of it. I was actually a terrible student my entire life. I was a really good athlete and I played football and Texas where it's essentially a religion. And so during the football season, my coaches would help me get tutoring and X, Y, and Z to make sure that all I always had passing grades. And then as soon as the season was over, I didn't have passing grades anymore until the next season. And so I ended up dropping out of high school. I went for four years, but I had the credits of a sophomore at that time. So I dropped out of high school, got my GED and joined the Navy. You know, went to became a, went to become a Navy SEAL. Of course, you know, being an athlete, you know, through my childhood and then being a SEAL, most of my exposure to medicine was orthopedics and sports medicine because, you know, I, like everyone else, I got injured, you know, I got little injuries here and there and had to go see doctors about it. So that's kind of was my vision of medicine. Uh, I met a girl out here who eventually would become my wife and she was in grad school to become a physical therapist. You know, back in my day, you know, this was pre 9 11. We didn't have nearly the work to do that the SEALs do now when they're deployed. So you always had to take a bunch of books when you deployed so you'd have something to read. This is well before the days of the internet and uh, Amazon Prime and all that. So I would take her textbooks, like her anatomy and physiology textbooks or kinesiology textbooks. And I just I was fascinated by all that. And I would take those on deployment and read textbooks all day. You know, when I, 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 you know, kind of decided that being a SEAL was a young single man's game and, and I was becoming neither. So I said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to bail out. I'm going to do something else with my life. You know, it's been a great experience. It's a great place to spend your twenties, but whatever I'm going. So I thought I'd be a physical therapist. You have to give like, you have to give like 2000 volunteer hours to even apply to a PT school. Wow. So, I started volunteering at this local sports medicine center out here called San Diego Sports Medicine Center. And, you know, that quickly turned into a job and, and I worked there the whole time I was in college, but it also quickly kind of taught me that I didn't want to be a physical therapist, that I, you know, that, that was a little too limited in scope and I wanted to do more. So, you know, so fast forward through all of that, you know, worked at San Diego Sports Medicine Center the whole time I was in college, went to... Uh, had to go to junior college for a while to make up for not graduating high school before I could get into a major university. And then I went to UCSD, graduated from there, and actually didn't even know that the military had their own medical school until I was applying for medical schools. I just found it in a book, in like one of those books you look up colleges in, and I was like, wow, I didn't know they had their own school. And then, yeah, I was already married, I already had kids, and I found out, you know, they're going to pay me to go to medical school instead of me paying somebody else. And you know, books are free and you know, equipment and all of that. And, uh, and I'm going to get a salary and I can support my family. So that was a pretty easy decision. Just banking on the fact that uh, banking on the hope that I would get back to the SEAL teams as their doctor. And I did. 
So I got back to the SEAL teams as their doc. You know, many years pass in between there, but you know, they're trying to keep this somewhat short. I got back to the SEAL teams and I, I got there at a, at a perfect time. It's an initiative they had been building for a few years to actually build a sports medicine center. And they, you know, I, I was obviously, I was the doc there, but I also had like this perfect background to do it. And so I was in charge of developing the sports medicine center. And, you know, we hired me and some, uh, you know, some other of the sort of healthcare staff and training staff, you know, we hired our very first nutritionist and we hired the very first athletic trainer and our very first strength and conditioning coach and, you know, all this stuff. And it was, it was great. We just built this fantastic center, or much like you would expect a professional sports team or at least a college team to have. And then I was, you know, I had ortho rounds coming through there and pain rounds coming through there, you know. So now I was the dumbest guy in the room because I'd hired all these experts that we had pulled from professional sports teams and Olympic Training Center and like, you know, all these just fantastic people who were very specialized. And so, in true military fashion, when you don't know, you know, when you're the dumbest guy, they put you in charge. And so, yeah. so I then became the manager of all of these people. And, you know, so managing the center, you know, the seal, like my office was literally in this clinic, which was like half clinic and half gym. And so the seals would come in my office and I had been a seal recently enough to where lots of my buddies who I went through training with and that I was a seal with, you know, I still knew, you know, and they're still in the seal teams and they would come in my office and close the door and say, Hey man, let me tell you what's really going on. And the reason for this is just like any other sort of elite performance organization, there's, you know, there's very tight guidelines as to, as to what they'll accept for limitations on your performance. So obviously like if you have a broken arm or something, they, you know, you can't go out on this mission with your crew because you have a broken arm, but you know, you keep backing that up and it's like, okay, well, if you have this disease title or if you're taking this type of medication, like you can't, you're, you know, you're disqualified from your job. So they don't want to tell the medical profession anything. They just say, everything's good. Every time you see a doc, great. I feel great, doc. No problems. Everything's hundred percent. So they came in my office and they would say, let me tell you what's really going on. And it was all about the stuff that you had alluded to, you know, it was all about, you know, sex drive and mood and body composition and motivation and, you know, a, you know, appetite regulation, concentration, mental focus, uh, memory, you know, they're just be like, I don't feel like myself. I feel like there's something wrong or something missing here. Right. Even and, though these guys are super active, they're young, they're already in w- the top special forces unit on the yeah. planet. But something's going on. Yeah. And they don't know exactly what's going on because they don't talk to each other about this either. (laughs) But they just feel like there's something a little off, right? And again, like I had this great sports medicine background and I was planning to go back into orthopedic surgery as my residency. And I'm just kind of befuddled. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, (laughs) like, I, I don't know why you're having all these problems. This doesn't make any sense to me. And one thing that was mentioned almost as an aside was that they didn't sleep very well, right? They didn't sleep very long and they usually had to use some sort of drug to get them to sleep, whether that was a prescription drug, an over-the-counter drug or alcohol as the drug or all three, you know, you name it, they were doing it to get to sleep and they weren't sleeping very well. They're waking up really early and then going, you know, I'll I'll go to the gym, I'll work out really hard and that will, you know, then I'll be super tired tonight and then I'll sleep and I'll say, how long have you been working on that plan? They'll be like, you know, like five years. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. Probably going to work today then. You know, like, so keep going. So yeah, so uh, getting, you know, this is all sort of the securest way of getting to your question. But now I find myself in a position where I'm talking to guys about all of these potentially disqualifying things, right? When you start talking about mood and you know mood and emotional affective disorders, like you're talking about psychi- you know, psychiatric diagnosis, where even and like something like an antidepressant requires another layer of bureaucracy to judge whether or not you're now qualified to do your job. Sex drive wouldn't be such an issue, but do do we really think that a 35 year old seal has a Viagra deficiency and that's why he can't? have this why he has a low sex drive of course not i just it said there's some other deficiency going on so i started pulling out these huge panels of labs just to kind of figure out all right what like what can we find what sort of pattern can i find and then i just started researching 
I started researching sleep specifically just because so many guys had mentioned that they didn't sleep well and so many guys had mentioned that, that they that, that they were using sleep drugs or sleep aids. And, you know, kind of this light bulb goes off in my head that, hey, guess when testosterone is secreted? When you're in deep sleep. And guess when growth hormone is secreted? Oh, when you're in deep sleep. And guess when your immune system is its highest and you're, you know, you're repairing all of your damaged muscles and tendons and ligaments and all the stuff that you've ever used that day. Oh, yeah, that's happening during deep sleep. And Oh, guess when all this emotionality uh, stuff is categorized and handled and where your memories are consolidated and, you know, where your concentration comes from. Oh, that's coming from REM sleep. And and then you start looking at the effects of these drugs that they're using. And these things are known to interfere with sleep architecture. So they're known to interfere with deep sleep or REM sleep or both. And so now, now, like, as I said, I'm I'm under layers and layers of bureaucracy you know, the, the Bureau of Medicine oversees all medical care in the military under the entire DOD umbrella. They're the ones who give me my credentials to be able to practice medicine in the Navy. And yeah. they say, and they say you, you know, you're going to follow this protocol. And, you know, if, if this happens and you go through this algorithm and then they end up taking this drug, and if they, that drug is disqualifying, then you have to fill out this paperwork and see if they can still do their job. Wow. Um, and so... Th- I'm not going to do that. And these guys know I'm not going to do that. So that's why they come to talk to me. So I'm like, all right, well, let's see what else we can figure out. So it's not something like the Bureau of Medicine overseeing me as a doctor. The SEALs, you know, the SEALs don't see those limitations because they're thinking of like, what's this, you know, what is spec war going to allow me to do to treat these guys? They're going to be a lot more flexible, but ultimately it's the Bureau of Medicine's decision. So anyways, it forced me to be creative and get and to go rogue, as you say, and really going rogue just involved going back to evolutionary medicine, which is really what I do now. Which, you know, that term didn't really exist then, but the, you know, that's kind of what is what is being called now, which is basically you know just taking what we know now about physiology and nutrition and even genetics, and taking all of this new information, all of this. Uh, all the applicable science and, you know, keeping an eye towards evolution and how we evolved to do all of this stuff and, you know, see how all that fits together. And so, you know, the military wasn't about to allow me to start putting seals on testosterone because they like almost every single one of them who came to complain to me was, would have testosterone in the lowest 10% of the bell curve or sometimes even below below normal. And the endocrinologist would still tell them they were fine. And so they weren't about to let me start putting seals on testosterone or there would end up being an admiral on CNN explaining why all seals are taking steroids, you know, cause it's, you know, it's, yeah. you know, it's been completely vilified, you know, is this evil, this evil drug. <laughs> yeah. It's either guys are taking way too much when they're not addressing their lifestyle or we're looking at athletes who are, yeah, it's just a, a mess in the media. Yeah. Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, it, it's really a completely laughable thing that this, you know, this hormone that's produced in, you know, in every mammal on the planet, you know, you know that we've we've had in our bodies since the onset of puberty, both men and women, is, is somehow on par with you know, like cocaine and heroin and and, <laughs> and crack and all this stuff. So, I, I, so, anyways, for another so, podcast, I, that discussion, yeah, right? Some, yeah, something for a different time, but so. I said about basically saying, all right, how can I improve some of this stuff without drugs? And the, you know, the very first thing that came to me is, well, let's get these guys sleeping and let's get them off of the sleep aids and then see what happens. Okay. Revolutionary concept. You know, let's do something like we more like we evolved to do. <laughs> you know, most of these guys were eating pretty well. Like uh, most of these guys listened to Rob Wolf's podcast and um, sort of in its heyday, not that it's not still you know going really strong today, but you know, when he was really sort of blowing up and these guys, you know, they were all eating really smart. They were all over training and they always will. That's just the lifestyle, but nobody was paying any attention to sleep, even though, you know, Rob was doing a great job of talking about sleep. Everybody just kind of let that go in one ear and out the other because they didn't want to hear that part. And they still don't, by and large. It's very unpopular. Yeah, method. it's the, the chemicals in our environment and the GMOs that are really screwing up our uh, hormone levels, right? And right. It's not and, you staying up late yeah. at night, like yeah. in researching that stuff on the internet. 
<laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It's not the fact that you've been sleeping five hours a night for the past twenty years. That has nothing to do with your hormone issues. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. And the endocrine disruptors, you know, that those things are are problematic. But you're not going to escape them. Like to say you're going to escape plastic is okay, laughable. Like you you couldn't go find a deserted island and and not find, uh, you know, endocrine disrupting chemicals and and the water and plants there. But anyways, uh, that's a, a digression. So, yeah, so I, I really started working hard on getting these guys off of sleep aids. Now, the problem with, with this, and, and I don't ever say that these guys were addicted to sleep aids. I think that term is a little too harsh. I think that they were accustomed to it and that it, it was culturally normal. And it's what everyone did. And, by, and, by, and in some instances, they had to have them. Like, they had to have sleep drugs. If you wake up at you know, seven o'clock in the morning and at nine o'clock in the morning, they come and say, Hey, we got a tasker and we're going out, you know, tonight at 2 a.m. So if you want to get any sleep for the next two days, now's your time to sleep. And they're like, well, I just woke up. So (laughs) you know, what what am I going to do? Okay. I'll go take a couple of Ambien and I'll, you know, I'll get, you know, four more hours of sleep and I'll get up and start getting ready for this op or whatever. So traveling across multiple time zones or whatever. So like the things that sleep aids were designed for these guys, that's how it all started. But then it, it just came to where these guys needed them. And especially when they came home, they needed them even more than when, when they were deployed. And that was, you know, whether you were talking about prescriptions, again, like Ambien or Lunesta, or if you're talking about over-the-counter stuff like Benadryl, or if you're talking about just using alcohol or, you're, you know, again, any combination thereof, these guys were doing it, especially when they were home. So I said, well, let's see what we can do to get them off of that. And the problem with that is, you know, sleep is a physiological function that everybody needs. And they were using these sleep aids because they needed them to go to sleep. So I couldn't just very well take them away and say, you got nothing, now go to sleep. So that's kind of how I, I developed this sleep supplement, the sleep formula that, that I released back in May is, you know, when I went back to the textbooks and, you know, started training with experts in this field and sort of the wellness arena, you know, as I reverse engineered sleep, you know, there's a whole long circuitous story as to where my logic path took me. But eventually I just said, well, you know, let's give these guys everything that they need in order to initiate the normal cascades of sleep and to maintain those cascades of sleep. And let's see if they actually stay asleep. And it took, a, you know, a couple of years of fiddling around with various ingredients and various, you know, concentrations or dosages of these supplements. And I got every seal off of Ambien, like, or, or whatever they were using that none of them, you know, everybody who was seeing me no longer needed sleep aids. They were taking this supplement. The problem was that the supplement was, you know, pills and powders and liquids and, you know, and they had to buy some at this store and some at that store and some online. And it was just kind of a pain in the ass for them to take it. So they kept nagging me to make a product out of it. And I spent a couple of years trying to work with other pharmaceutical or with other uh, supplement companies and even some compounding pharmacies and stuff to try to get it made. And it was just really hard to, it's really hard to get somebody else to do your project the way you want them to. So, yeah, so I kind of backed out. I, I didn't back out completely, but I slowed down my clinical practice a lot, went really to a primarily a, a um consulting and coaching role and you know, developed that sleep product and into one product that these guys can now take. So yeah, a sleep uh, cocktail, right? And yeah. anyone who's listening, if you want to check it out, obviously you hear Kirk has done his research. He knows a ton about this stuff. He's someone I remember on, on the first time we talked, Kirk, you're like, yeah, man, I was listening to something you said, you know, a lot about sleep. And I was like, dude, I learned like most of that stuff from you. So yeah, if you've heard me talk about sleep, Kirk, you're the guy who I learned m- the majority about it, especially in terms of biochemistry, I guess you would say what happens yeah. the the steps <laughs> So, so yeah, I'll definitely have that link. Kirk, you've talked about a bunch of different things. Uh, one thing that I'd love you to talk about is we've been mentioning, or you've been talking about how you work with SEALs and obviously they've got a very stressful job. They do night ops. They've got to be doing something at two o'clock in the morning, like you mentioned. Can you paint the picture of what's going on right now with like the average American? 
w- yeah. in terms of sleep and man, and, and put it in the priority because I mentioned endocrine disruptors and I'm with you on that. Of course, you're a doctor. I'm not. But so even if I disagreed, but I'm with you on that. But I feel like people need something like sexy, something hot to talk about. And sleep is just like, ah. Oh, Man, I just want to blame the evil corporations who are poisoning the environment. It's like, yeah, that's important, but can you just paint that picture for the the average for the person listening to this right now who maybe hasn't been an elite operator in, in the military? They're yeah. just trying to get through their life, having optimal health and doing the best they can in their job, their business. Yeah, well, I mean, it, you, what you bring up is is a very very salient point, and it's. And it's actually, frankly, it's the most surprising facet or aspect of my career is that people are so resistant to sleep. You know, the, the sleep message, I should say. I did a TEDx talk, I guess, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. The title of it was America's Biggest Problem. And, you know, to date, I have like one, like, I think I calculated it out a few months ago. I have like, 0.06% of the views of how to make a Chinese throwing star out of notebook paper. So, <laughs> yeah, or cat videos. Yeah, right? so that's, that's pretty humbling. I'm like, okay, uh, <laughs> you know, my life's work in this in this message that I honestly think could you know could make a huge difference to all the Western world, but definitely America. Just being really tossed aside said, no, 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 we want to fold notebook paper into Chinese throwing stars. That's what's important. So anyways, as you say, like it, people are looking for something sexy. They're looking for something revolutionary. They want some kind of gadget. They want some sort of elixir. I always like my, my thought was, oh, this, this will be easy. Like I'll just show them the biochemistry of this and they'll say, oh, that's, that makes sense. I'm going to go sleep. And it, and it should be like selling sex, right? Just like it's a normal physiological function. It feels good. You don't need any special equipment to do it. You know, like why wouldn't everybody just jump on board? And I can tell you that, you know, I started this with, with the SEALs and I thought it was a SEAL specific problem or at least kind of a, a high end performing problem. Yeah. All the CEOs that say they only yeah. sleep four hours, Donald Trump. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I thought, you know, okay, this is this is a problem that's created by people who want to drive themselves extra hard to be the elite performers. And then once I got out of the military and I started doing more, you know, more clinical practice and more private practice stuff, everybody's suffering from the same thing. You know, I, I got invited to do this all day training for over in Germany f- for all these people who uh, are in charge of the education and, and, and counseling for de- deployed military families. So, that, you know, they were overseeing basically the school system and they wanted, they wanted me to talk about sleep and the effects of sleep on adolescents and sleep deprivation and, you know, their gaming and their iPhones and all that kind of stuff. You know, I started I was like, okay, I'll do it. But I mean, it's not where my expertise lies. Uh, you know, this was three, three years ago, maybe four years ago. And now I'm like, you know, once I, once I started looking to that, I'm like, okay, well, 15 year old high school students had the exact same problems as Navy SEALs. Their mothers that are dragging them out of bed and, you know, schlepping them to school and back and forth to their soccer practice and all these activities, their mothers have the same problems. Their fathers have the same problems, whether they're running a drill press or they're the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. Everybody seems to consider sleep as this luxury or some sort of even worse, like some sort of sign of being lazy or weak. Like it, there's something wrong with you if you're not if you're not bounding out of bed at 5 a.m. to get more work done than everybody else. And you know, as you say, people are really resistant to it. And I can go through and I show them the physiology and, and the difference with the seals is although you know, oftentimes their sleep schedule is externally driven, there is a significant amount of time where they can control their sleep. And what it comes down to comes down to his prioritization. And so I could get up on the stage and lecture these guys about how testosterone and growth hormone are produced 
while they're in uh, deep sleep. And if they're drinking themselves to sleep and using sleep drugs, they aren't getting deep sleep, which means their testosterone is low. It means their growth hormone is low. It mean, you know, means their insulin sensitivity is low. It means that they're more likely to you know, use any fuel that they eat uh, to be stored as fat than to be used as energy or stored as muscle glycogen and like go through this whole pathway with them. And they get it. And they're like, well, shit, I want to be an elite performer, so I'm going to sleep. So it was pretty easy to motivate those guys in those terms. You know, whether, whether or not you can motivate, you know, the soccer mom or the, the drill press operator to just say, this is going to improve the quality of your life, you know, without them being super knowledgeable or super passionate about hormones or physiology, it's a little tougher to sell. And unfortunately, my biggest problem is that, you know, I'd say I really started studying this stuff in earnest, sleep in particular, in earnest, I, was, I started getting to the hormone dysregulation, dysregulation a few years before, but uh, sleep in earnest really since 2009. So it's about six years of that going on, maybe seven years of that. The more I learn about it, the more I cannot find anything that sleep just doesn't seriously impact. And that's the worst sales pitch in the world is to say, I have this one thing that will make everything better. Yeah, and that's what they say. Yeah. Un- unfortunately, it's true. Like th- when I talk about enhancing performance, and you mentioned it earlier about people who want to perform better, being on, you're listening to your show. When I say performance, I mean performance in any way that you measure yourself. I don't care what that performance is. It's, you know, how quickly can you fold a Chinese throwing star out of paper is impacted by your sleep. (laughs) How much weight you can lift, how fast you can run, how quickly you can organize folders in the filing drawer, uh, how fast you can type, how well you can remember your tasks for the day, how clear your decisions are, how good your willpower is, your emotional connection with your spouse, your communication skills, your body composition, your appetite regulation, everything is not only impacted by sleep, but hugely impacted by sleep. And nearly, like almost all those things, you could say the majority of it comes from sleep. Yeah. And it's just incredibly powerful. And I'll tell you, it's something that was the missing component for myself as well, although I'm, I'm no SEAL by any stretch. I, I've done a lot of martial arts training, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and MMA in particular, and doing a full-time personal training business as, as well. And just, I was working out hard and doing everything that I thought I was supposed to do. And yet I was having all these problems around 30 years old. And, you know, I, it, it was when I really got into the whole idea of sleep, especially with some of the the trauma that I've been through losing my sister, my brother. And I, I basically have had messed up sleep cycles since I was 19 and didn't even know it. So if you're listening and you have any type of issues, psychological, emotional, being overweight, everything that Kirk just ran through, this is something that is vital to your to your success in every area of your life. I mean, there's just nothing around. What I say, Kirk, and maybe this, I think you'll agree, is there's no pill you can take. There's no exercise you can do. There's no diet you can go on that can make up for sleep deprivation. And I'd yeah. love- And there's no- there's no biohacks either. You know? <laughs> everybody, everybody wants to- bio- Polyphasic yeah. sleep. Yeah. Right. And- I tell everybody, especially people that I, you know, that are clients or mine or, or people that I coach or consult with or whatever, I always give this metaphor of there being four pillars of health, like I alluded to earlier. There's sleep, there's exercise, and that doesn't technically need to be exercise. If you're not athletic, I don't like to scare people off. We call that activity, you, but you have to be active to be healthy. You have to get sleep to be healthy. You have to have good nutrition to be healthy, and you have to be good at managing your stress. That's becoming more and more, more and more powerful, more and more important. And I think that's coming to awareness now. That's kind of like the new one that's really sort of popping up is how do you manage your stress in this constant information and stimulation overload that we run into, you know, that we live in. And there we're talking about balancing autonomics and so forth, which, you know, we could get into if you wanted to. Um, but basically, you know, maybe this it, when I have you back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I tell people, you know, think of those four 
pillars of health as the same as being four, you know, the four tires on a car. If you're running around on three tires and you just like you just simply or, you know, maybe you have one of those little donut spares on one one of as one of your wheels because you're sleeping five hours a night or six hours a night or whatever. So it, that pillar isn't completely gone. But, you know, if, if your buddy pulls up to, you know, to your house and you're out in your front yard and your buddy pulls up in his car and he's got one wheel off of his car and you know he comes grinding up to your house and he's like, hey, man. I think there's something wrong with my car. You know, this, uh, I think maybe the fuel system, like I got some bad fuel or something, or there's a fuel filter clogged or, you know, something's going on, maybe the onboard computer, but the performance just really doesn't seem to be there. That's kind of like going into a doctor and saying, Hey, you know, I'm really having issues with my sex drive. And the doctor will put the new fuel filter on, which is like Viagra, right? Um, sure. But obvi- you know, it's obvious when you give that metaphor that, well, Let's put another tire on your car first, and then let's see how the performance goes, right? And it's, that's the same thing. So that's really what I'm doing when I work with clients is I say, you know, let's get all four pillars aligned. Let's strengthen them and, you know, get them all built up as well as we can. And then we'll look at complaints. You know, then we'll look and see, is there something that's not correcting by correcting these four pillars? And almost always... The answer to that is no. Like everything usually comes back in the line just by correcting those four pillars. But I'm not, um, you know, I'm not naive, and I realize that people have built their lives in a certain way to where some things are beyond their control, and maybe they have to work night shift, and so that sleep pillar is always going to be a little weak, you know, or they travel a ton, and so the sleep pillar, it not only is the sleep pillar maybe weak, but the nutrition pillar is harder to do as well. And the activity, you know, pillar is even harder to do with travel schedules. So there's ideal and there's reality. And then where supplements and pharmaceuticals come in or hormones come in is, you know, hormone therapy comes in is, is to bridge that gap between whatever your best reality is and whatever optimal is, you know, let's still get you to optimal, but by all means, let's correct as much of it as we can through lifestyle. And there's lots of reasons for that. Uh, there's lots of reasons to do it that way, but that, you know, that's the foundation of what I do. Yeah. And, and that's such a great point. So if you're listening right now and you're, you just can't think about your sleep, how good is it? How much do you have and what the quality is, right? Because that's important too. You're uh, known as your sleep architecture, right? And right. then your activity levels or exercise, how are your gains and how frequent are you exercising? Then nutrition and then stress. And if you're down on all those, you're just, you, you know, you're just not going, man, you're just not going to be performing in life very well, whether you're trying to be an awesome dad or an awesome business owner, whatever it is for you. Kirk, you talked about the sleep cocktail that you've come up with. Let's break down some practical steps or what you would say to someone to get this area handled. Okay. So the first thing that I always tell everybody is that the most important aspect of improving your sleep is prioritizing sleep. You can read about this in any kind of self-help book you want from you know, ranging from the spiritual to you know, building a business. It, it, you can look back at uh, Napoleon Hill's book, you know, Think and Grow Rich. Like, you know, all of these, all of these things share this, this concept in, this, in that whatever you focus on will expand. Like wherever you put your attention, that area of your life will expand and improve and grow. So if you say, well, you know, the stock parsley guy says I need to sleep. So I'm going to put that on my to-do list along with all these other you know, 47 things that I need to do every day. That's probably not the level of prioritization that's going to give you the, the growth. So what I tell everybody to do is, you know, first of all, let's just convince yourself that this matters. I don't know how many 30 day challenges I've seen out there in my lifetime with all, you know, from internet to, to television, all these 30 day challenges, right? Well, I say, just give me seven days, give me one week where sleep is your priority. And whatever that means, like whatever you have to change around in your life. And I'm not asking you to do this for eight days or nine days or 10 days, just seven days. Like at the end of the seven days, no matter what, you can go back to the way you're living. But just do the seven days, prioritizing your sleep for seven days. 
is enough to convince people that, oh my God, like I really needed more sleep and I didn't know that I needed more sleep. One of the big problems with sleep is that we don't have an objective experience of sleep, right? So we go to sleep and then we wake up and we don't really know what happens happened in between there. So we don't know what our sleep architecture was. We don't know if we woke up 347 times or if we woke up once, if we didn't like truly wake up to full consciousness. So because there's not a great objective measure for that, I just tell people, you know, you need to get in bed, like schedule yourself, do all the sleep hygiene stuff, right? And and that's, there's nothing revolutionary about that. Probably everybody on your show has heard that before, but if not, we can cover that in like two minutes, but do all the sleep hygiene stuff, get yourself in bed, get yourself in bed for eight hours, set an alarm clock and just say, I'm not getting out of bed until that alarm clock goes off. That's the prioritization. Do that for seven days and then just simply observe what your life is like. Like, do you feel smarter? Do you feel happier? Is your, you know, are your relationships going better? Are you performing better at work? Are you performing better in athletics? You know, do you hurt less? Does your, you know, has your body composition started to shift? You know, like anything that you measure yourself by, I guarantee you is going to be noticeably different in those seven days, by the end of those seven days, at least. If not right away, like some of it will be the next day. You'll be like, oh, wow. I felt really good today. I felt what have really I been sharp. doing to myself? That's how I yeah. felt. I'm like, why haven't yeah. I, why didn't everybody, it wasn't, uh, now sleep is so hot to talk about before it just wasn't. People would be like, oh yeah, sleep's important. But, yeah. uh, you, you know, you mentioned sleep hygiene and yeah, I've covered it on the show. Most of which I, again, I've learned from you. So if you heard me talk about it on this show, Kirk is, is one of the main people along with Tara Swart and uh, Dr. Tara Swart and, and a couple others. But here's a great question that I got from a listener, and maybe you can talk a little bit more in depth uh, based on his question. He asks, Bart asks, uh, really curious about how he would rank the different elements of sleep quality. For example, light pollution from ambient sources, time you go to sleep, wake slash wake up, consistency of sleep schedule, light exposure from natural and artificial sources during the day, stress, caffeine. As far as the hygiene recommendations, what would your prioritization of them be for, for someone who's looking to put this into play in their life? And medicine, a lot of the specialists like you're talking about, say like an endocrinologist versus a cardiologist versus you know, an oncologist or pulmonary doctor, whatever, they like to argue about like what's the most critical organ. And you know, the fact of the matter is that really apart from your appendix and your uh, ovaries, you, there aren't really many organs you can live without. <laughs> uh, so you know, sleep is kind of the same way, but you know, basically. What we're aiming for here, like the idea behind the sleep hygiene, the idea behind the gadgets, the idea behind all of the sleep ritualization is all focusing towards the same thing. It's getting a sufficient duration of quality sleep. When you start getting, you know, when you start saying that's the goal, well, then all of those other things are like tools to get to that goal. So it gets a little it gets a little individualized when you get there, you know, when you get there, because, you know, for some people, their biggest obstacle to getting quality sleep is their nutritional habits. For some people, it's the fact that they work night shift. For some people, it's the fact that they can't shut themselves down and they they work right up until the minute they go to sleep. For some people, it's that they can't get themselves motivated to get to bed in time. So it gets kind of individualized, but it, it basically like to really simplify it. And if there's any like you know, neuroscientists or sleep scientists um, listening to this, please forgive me for the oversimplification. But basically, you know, people have heard of circadian rhythms, right? Your body has a biorhythm that in, uses the sun to entrain itself to meet, you know, to match the days of the planet. And that's completely arbitrary. It has nothing, you know, that's just something we evolved into. There's no reason that it needs to be, that you need to sink to the sun other than, you know, that's how we live as a society is we, we do stuff during the day and we sleep at night. Uh, but, you know, to get yourself ready to go to sleep is just as important as getting yourself in, in bed for the proper duration, right? So, 
all of the sleep hygiene stuff, stress is part of that, like mitigating stress is part of that. This light saturation that he was talking about, that's part of it. Like everything really matters equally. Whatever you can, like whatever metric you can kind of fiddle around with that allows you to sleep more. So, you know, let's make this really simple and say you're giving yourself eight hours of sleep. You know, you're giving yourself eight hours of time in bed with the lights off and, you know, effectively putting yourself in a condition to be able to sleep. There's two things going on there's circadian rhythm. Is your circadian rhythm matched to where you're likely to go to sleep during this time? Yes or no. We, and we'd have to go through down a lot of rabbit holes for that. But that's what the light saturation is primarily about. Mm. The other thing is, is your neocortex. So like when we think of the human brain, like the picture of the human brain that we all think about with all those big sulci, those big wrinkles and the you know sort of fleshy looking aspect that brain that's you know the big human brain that makes us smart is how we interact with the environment so we are sensing the environment and we are interacting with the environment through this what we call neocortex and we're making decisions and we're thinking and we're planning and all that crap is going on in the neocortex if the neocortex is super busy we can't go to sleep those are really the two things to talk about really it's like are you doing everything you can to be entrained with the sunlight and getting a good quality of sleep, uh, putting yourself in bed for a sufficient number of hours and during the right hours. And then are you slowing down your brain enough to be able to get good sleep? Yeah. Then, yeah. I mean, and that that's a short, straightforward answer, Kirk. Yeah. And, and everything matters to get there. Right. So like, yeah. like all of those things matter. And so, you know, you have to kind of figure out where you're falling down on those. But the really simple thing, the really simple answer is that you need a sleep ritual, just like a little kid needs a sleep ritual. There's a reason that all little kids have sleep rituals is because kids don't go to sleep if they don't sleep well, if we don't give them the sleep ritual. Guess what? Grownups don't either. <laughs> but for some reason, we think we become immune to that, that need or you know that, that becomes superfluous as we get older. And that's not true. So you need a sleep ritual, and that sleep ritual is doing several things. It's decreasing the light exposure in your eyes, which is what computer programs like Flux is about, or wearing blue blocking glasses, or dimming the lights in your house, or buying the special light bulb in your house that don't have blue light. All of those types of things, that all that light saturation stuff, that's part of your sleep ritual. But also winding yourself down, doing some sort of breathing technique, doing some sort of meditation technique, doing some sort of you know, stretching, relaxation, it doesn't matter, but whatever it is, it's going to slow down that neocortex and allow you to go to sleep. And then whatever you can do to prep your, your neurochemistry by decreasing the light in your eyes to allow those cascades to go to sleep. Nutrition plays a part in there, exercise plays a part in there and all that. But those are the, like, if you want to deal with sleep as its own pillar, like that's the thing, those are the two things to think about right there. Yeah, and that's going to take some self-experimentation, playing around to see what works best for you and what affects you more. I feel like sound and light, I'm particularly sensitive to. And if I don't get that handled, I'm okay falling asleep as long as I get that handled that my mind doesn't usually, my neocortex is not usually like out of control. No, that's that's a great answer, Kirk. And everybody wants like a straightforward simple answer. And sometimes they're just, uh, it really needs to be a holistic approach. Like you mentioned, Kirk, I, I got another, I know we're coming up on an hour here and, and, uh, you've got to run cause you're a super busy dude. And it's the day after Thanksgiving, but I have another question here. You mentioned already, there's not really a great way of measuring our sleep. You, you mentioned something like that. I got another question from a listener and, uh, Desmond, asks, I just started using the sleep cycle app. How accurate are they when it comes to recording sleep? And he goes on to say, I like that it wakes me up inside of a 30 minute window. It -hmm. waits until I'm in my least deep sleep before it wakes him up. What do you think about that? And are there any things that you think are better? So my feeling on those sleep so what what he's talking about was it, that's actually one of the original sleep apps, and I think the I think there is a clever aspect of that waking you up in lighter levels of sleep just uh, tends to make you feel more refreshed and more motivated to get out of bed. Doesn't really obviously do much to 
to improve your overall time in bed or, or the quality of your sleep. It, it's just trying to wake you up at the, at the right time to where you'll feel the best when you wake up. But what these things are doing is something called actigraphy. And so they're really using movement to judge how much sleep you're in, like what level of sleep you're in. So when you're in stages three and four of sleep, what we call slow wave sleep or deep sleep or delta sleep, you're not paralyzed but your body tends not to move very much. When you're in REM sleep, your body is actually paralyzed. And that's when you're doing most of most of the dreams that you remember that's happening during REM sleep. And we think that's when a lot of the emotional categorization of events and, um, you know, sort of working out psychological problems, even subconsciously is probably happening during this dream state. And one thing we don't want to do is act out our dreams um, because that's when, you know, that's when people get hurt uh, when they're asleep and they're, they're trying to move and get out of bed or, you know, they're punching their spouses. I used to have fight dreams when <laughs> I, I was competing in Brazilian jiu-jitsu a lot. I can only imagine what a Navy SEAL uh, just coming back from like a really intense op might go through. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can, so you can probably attest to this is that probably when you had your fight dreams, you felt super weak during your fight. Like there was something about it where like, I just can't get, like, I just can't get this thing to go. Like I, whatever it is, you know, like whatever execution. It like was definitely I, a battle. It wasn't me like, yes, I'm just crushing my opposition. It was, it was yeah. definitely a battle. Yeah. And that's because at some level, your brain is registering that your body's paralyzed because there's actually a neurochemical pathway that's activated in your brain to paralyze you during sleep and what, or during REM sleep. And when that doesn't happen, uh, that's when we, you know, that's when some of the sort of sleep wake disorders are happening. But one of the things that you're sensing in those dreams is that your body's sensing that you can't, you like you just can't move. Your muscles aren't responding. And so I like, I used to have these dreams. I used to have fighting dreams where I like, I was like I was punching somebody as hard as I possibly could, but it like, it wouldn't have broken a piece of notebook paper, you know, like it was just like, it was just like no power to it. And I was like trying to will every ounce of strength I had into a punch. And it was just like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have hurt a five-year-old girl. And I was like, what's going on? And, and, and that was because my body's paralyzed, but totally. That's digress. good to know. Yeah. But that's good to know. Yeah. Total digression. But, you know, getting back to actigraphy, what actigraphy is measuring movement. There's some more sophisticated equipment now where they're getting some uh, heart rate in there and some heart rate variability in there. There's even some people to going as far as do like what we call pulse ox, like measuring how much oxygenation is going through your, or how much, how saturated your red blood cells are with oxygen. There's, you know, people that are putting like electrodes on their head that have these apps that are measuring their brain waves, And, you know, they're trying to come more and more close to, you know, with a polysomnograph, which is the gold standard for sleep, which we can really define the sleep architecture. But you know, my real answer to that is if you like those gadgets, if you like those apps, by all means, use them because there's some measurement there. Now, this is good data for you. It's probably not going to help your doctor, you know, in any facet, help you with your problems other than you having some reasonable idea of how much you're sleeping. It's at least one tool to, for people to have some awareness to go, Oh, look, I like, I'm not sleeping as much as I, as I should, you know, I'm going to try to get better off of this one metric. The truth of the matter is if you got in your bed and laid down for eight hours and read a book the whole time and somebody else was turning the pages for you and you never moved, it would say that you slept for eight hours. So it, it's limited in its in how truthful the application is, but it, it's at least showing that you have you know that you're motivated that you've like you're putting it as a priority. You're using some metric, and as you know, you know from from your line of work, anything you know you you can't improve anything that you don't measure. So some sort of metric should be there. And if you like the gadgets, by all means, go for it. If you want to journal and record how much you sleep on a piece of paper, that's just as good in my mind. You said there's nothing is nowhere near the polysonogram. Did I say that correctly? Close enough. (laughs) Okay. Polysomnograph. Somnograph. Somnograph. So there's nothing that approximates that really, but do you have one that you like better than the others? They're getting closer. You know, they, as I said, they could be fooled, but for the most part, they are getting better. I, I don't have like a very, a super strong preference towards any one thing. I, I say it totally depends on how, how much you're wired that way. There's one called the Omega wave. 
The, oh yeah, that's uh, it's HRV, but it does yeah. sleep as well. Yeah. So and and that one is the one that actually measures brain waves and HRV and actigraphy. And so now you're getting super close to the polysomnograph. Like that's like that's probably the pinnacle of gadgetry out there as far as what I know right now. But something, you know, like a, a Fitbit or a Jawbone or, you know, those things that, that are just purely actigraphy or even the apps that you can put on your phone and then you put your phone under your pillow or whatever. Anything is better than nothing. I don't think that there's one that I would say, oh yeah, absolutely use this one because it's going to, it's going to get you to your goal faster. What's going to get you to your goal is, is taking this stuff seriously. Yeah, so true, Kirk. And I love what you said there, that if it motivates you to take it more seriously, if having an app or some sort of measuring device motivates you to take it more seriously and gives you something to measure, it's better, then it's a good thing. And and it doesn't need to be a polysomnograph uh, level. So Kirk, man, this has been an awesome conversation. I want to wrap it up now because I feel like you and I could talk for another couple hours because that's what we did last time. I'd yep. love to have you back on to go down the digestion rabbit hole because I think that's something that's really misunderstood in the health and fitness industry and definitely by medicine. But for those listeners who want to hear more about you to check out Sleep Cocktail, can you tell them where to find more of your information as well as to find uh, Sleep Cocktail? Yeah, so the the simplest thing you can you can go to my site, it's just DOC Parsley, like the herb, so docparsley.com. You can get to my supplement site from there, but you can also go directly to the the sleep supplement site, and that's called sleepcocktails.com. Unfortunately, we're going to have to rename that. It turns out to be a terrible name for a lot of reasons, but it's just what the seals ended up calling it was the parsley cocktail. So we just ended up naming it that, but it's it's blocked from like DOD and DOJ computers and big corporate computer systems oh, yeah. because of the word cocktail. Um, and th- there's there's lots of uh, problems in there, and you know, uh, with people who are anti-alcohol, and so not that there's alcohol in it, but just the connotation of it is enough to disrupt some things. So, anyways, that that's going to end up changing. But yeah, I'd say just go to docparsley.com. Within the next month, we're going to actually put all of my content on there. I started that site like a year ago, but I've been so busy and I'm such an IT moron that although I have, I probably have 50 blogs out there, only a couple of them are actually on my site. (laughs) They're on everybody else's site. I have them on my LinkedIn site, but I don't know how to put it on my own site. Um, But anyways, yeah, docparsley.com. There's some podcasts that I've done on there. There's some videos that I've done. I think my TED Talk is on there. The uh, My story, kind of more about my bio, more about my philosophies on there. And you, there's a link to the sleep site on there. And then there's a link to all the people that I or that are my go-to experts as well. So, like I, you know, nobody can know everything. And uh, like, I, there's definitely some professionals that I have the highest respect for that that are my go-to guys when you know, things get too complex with, for me, I, I use, these are the guys I rely to re- rely on and, and their sites are on there as well. Links to them. Awesome. Yeah. And all that will be on the show notes in case you're, you're working out right now or you're driving, you can't get to your phone or your computer and check this out, but I definitely want you to check out uh, Doc Parsley. We'll have the websites as well as the resources. We'll have his Ted talk up. Kirk, man, thank you so much for being on the show today, sharing your your knowledge, your your wisdom, and your time, of course, man. Do you have any final last words just to get people over the edge to, to take this stuff more seriously so they can benefit from all the amazing things that good quality sleep can do? The one thing that I like to point out to people who are maybe a little bit skeptical after listening to everything that I've said and maybe on hundred percent convinced it's something that's actually in my Ted talk as well. But I always tell people this, if this body that we live in is, you know, at least a hundred thousand years old, if not a couple hundred thousand years old, we evolved on this planet, just like every other animal has evolved on this planet. We are the only animal on this planet that purposefully sleep deprives itself. And if we could have evolved to sleep four hours a night as opposed to eight hours a night, evolution would have and should have favored that. And we would be all running around on four hours a night being optimal. The fact that we haven't evolved that way means that sleep is pretty damn important or we wouldn't spend a third of our lives doing it. So just take that into 
consideration the next time you're thinking of it as an unnecessary luxury or a sign of weakness. It's, there would be no different than saying that eating is a sign of weakness or exercising is a sign of weakness or, or trying to control your stress is somehow a sign of weakness or laziness or anything else. It's really on par with all those things it should be thought of just the same as any of those things and nobody would make the argument that if you eat you're weak i love it doc parsley thank you so much and uh looking forward to having you back on in the near future that's it for now speak to you soon